Another example of a memory written by a pen is a guilt that you feel when you did something wrong. Let me share you a personal experience of me. Okay, so this is the school that I went for undergraduate. Um, it's called Pacific Union College, one of the uh, Seventh-day Adventist school uh, located in Angwin, California. As you can see, the campus is beautiful. It was voted number one most beautiful campus in the whole United States. It's surrounded by a wine uh, country. Napa is a wine country. It's surrounded by wines and they're surrounded by a lot of, lot of trees there. So the air is very fresh. Whenever you wake up in the morning, everyone is jogging to experience this wonderful campus. So I had a very good memory in here. For four years, uh, I was studying biology, I was studying biochemistry, I was trying to prepare to go into dental school with a lot of friends. We had a great memory there. All the great memories, except one bad memory and that bad, bad memory was caused by a guilt inside of me. So one day in the morning, I believe it was in 2008, uh, somewhere around the uh, autumn, uh, the fall day. As you can see on the title, it says, four Napa Valley College students die in car crash. There were four people who died on a car crash on this morning at that night. And then everyone was mourning. This is a picture of the road, and this is where they had that accident. And when that happened, instantly, four of them died at that moment in this very place. So in order to commemorate them, we placed the cross, four crosses, and then we put their favorite items next to it. The first cross, you see a, a protein bar. This friend of mine, he liked to work out. He was very muscular. He had good body, good looks. So uh, to commemorate him, we put his favorite muscle milk beside and his favorite t-shirts. This was a shocking moment for everyone, all our college students. But especially it was shocking for me. Because on this yellow highlights, you see a name, Chong Wan Shin, 20 years old from Aloha, Oregon. This was my roommate. I had three roommates during my freshman year, and this was one of my roommates. We knew each other from our high school days. We went to the same church, we didn't go to the same school. He went to a private school, and I went to a Seventh-day Adventist uh, high school. But we went to the same church, so I knew his parents, he knew my parents, everyone. We were, growing, we were great friends. But on this very day, when the accident happened, he was gone. He was just banished from the campus. And I was feeling very sad. I was feeling sorrow. I was feeling guilt for his death. I don't know why, but that's how I felt. So this is uh, not the exact picture of our dorm room, but this is about the same structure. So three of us from same high school areas, same high school friends, we, we rented the same uh, one, one bedroom. And then we would have, uh, we would organize our beds like this. Uh, and it, uh, especially uh, the bed on the left side, we put it on the right side so that we would have three story beds. I would use the very bottom one. And sometimes at night, you fart, right? And then I farted. Uh, a few seconds later, one above me, he would say something to me. No, Jay, don't fart. And then one above me would say something, you know, a few seconds. We had very good memories. We talked a lot, and then we had a great time for about a year. So when they passed away, when the car accident happened, we gathered together in a church like this on the chapel. We worshiped together at Friday, Friday Vespers, and then we invited their parents to come on Saturday service to commemorate them. However, I couldn't attend those meetings. In fact, I didn't attend any one of those meetings because of my guilt inside. However, I decided to go to his funeral for the last time. This is not the exact funeral, but in, the, in American funeral tradition, they, sometimes they have an open casket. So they would have an open casket, and you can see their dead face for the last time. That would be a lasting memory. 
when I was standing in line, when I walked up to his coffin, and when I saw his face, I couldn't help but cry. Because his handsome face was torn apart. They tried to stitch it, they tried to suture it, and they tried to cover it with a thick makeup. However, all the torn apart parts were visible to me. And then that, made, that broke my heart at that moment. I still have that vivid visual in my head right now. I can't imagine how he looked like on his very last moment. This guilt persisted. And the reason was, as a high school friend, I persuaded him to come to QC with me, to the very college with me. Uh, he had a scholarship offer. He went, he was destined to go to one of the Oregon State University, big name college, very good school, with uh, wonderful teachers, wonderful staff members. But I asked him to join with me to come to Pacific Union College so that we can worship together, so that we can have a great time. So three of us, we went to the same college, we went in the same room, and had a great time. But after his death, it impacted me. I was keep thinking, Jay, you were an idiot. You shouldn't have persuaded him to come to PUC with me. You were selfish at that moment. You needed a friend, so you asked him to join with you. And I shouldn't have done that. So on this funeral, when I saw their parents, I couldn't say a word. I felt really sorry for them. And that guilt persisted for a few years. I had to go to a school council for about a year to cure this memory. We talk for about an hour each week so that I can remedy this past. So for me, that memory and that vivid visual image of his last moment in the coffin was a pen, was written in pen. It can never be erased for me. Erasers are useless for me. So as a Christian, how do we deal with this guilt? How do we solve it? And how do we live with it? Do you have any ideas? I'm pretty sure you all have guilt in somewhere inside your hearts. Somewhere inside your heart, you're so embarrassed that you can't even tell your friends about that guilt. Because when you tell them, they're going to judge on you. So you try to burden yourself by carrying the cross. And at that very moment, life stops from progressing. Like I told you, I had to go to the school council for about over a year, once every week, so that I won't live on the past, so that I can progress in the present, that I can progress, focus on the future. That was a very hard moment for me. So like Mr. Baroon uh, opened with this uh, a Bible verse, 2 Corinthians 7.10 says, Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret, but worldly sorrow brings death. Here on this Bible verse, you see two types of guilt. The first type of guilt is godly sorrow. Second type of guilt is worldly sorrow. Two different types of guilt, and we have two different results. What are the results? First type, it leads to salvation. It leads to eternal happiness. What about the second verse? Second verse, it leads to what? Death. It leads to death. So let's take a closer look at these two types of sorrow. First type of sorrow is godly sorrow. This is a good one. This is a happy one. This is a balo, balo of sorrow. Uh, let us read this verse. I'll read it for you. There is godly sorrow that leads a person to repentance, which is known as conviction. Matthew 5, 3 says, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Why does Matthew says, Blessed are the poor in spirit? Well, I think it's saying, for me, I think it's saying, I know that I'm spiritually poor. I know that I cannot be righteous from my own will, from my own action. So I need to ask for God's mercy. I need to turn to Him. I think this is, the past, this is what the passage is saying. Blessed are the poor in spirit. This person is blessed by God with mercy because he knows that he can't do nothing. He's very weak. That's why he's blessed with the kingdom of heaven. 
You know C.S. Lewis there, on the very last quote? He's my favorite book author. He wrote The Chronicles of Narnia. He was a professor in both Oxford and Cambridge. Theologist, novelist, poem. He wrote poem. He did everything, every wonderful thing. This is what he said about true guilt. He said, true guilt is an emergency bell. So let's say, let's say you're interconnected with God like this. You have a ring with God. Emergency bell siren says when this interconnection breaks, right? This is a good sign. This is like a fire alarm. So whenever we have the fire smoke coming out in your room, it fire alarms, it makes you to realize that something's wrong with you. So we've got to escape, right? So uh, true guilt, good guilt is an emergency bell. Now let's take a look at the bad guilt, the worldly guilt. So the worldly gift, worldly sorrow, is a negative type of guilt. With this, you will have a bad cycle. You will have a bad cycle. And then for this, you will have a condemnation or accusation from the devil, from the Satan. When you have worldly sorrow, when you have a worldly guilt, like what I went through, Satan doesn't pass that opportunity. He sees that opportunity, he sees that chance, crawl up onto you like a snake, and then he eats you up with it. So sometimes when people try to carry their own cross by themselves, they make radical choices. What kind of radical choices? What kind of extreme choices they make? They may, they may choose death. They may choose suicide, like what Judah did after he betrayed Jesus. So Mark 14, 72 says, uh, before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times, and Peter broke down and wept. This is a powerful, powerful message. This is like an emergency bell that what C.S. Lewis wrote. What's the emergency bell in this passage? It's the rooster crows. It's the sound of the rooster. It's the sound of the chicken. Whenever you hear that, you need to uh, remedy your heart. You need to look into your heart and say, what's wrong with me? What's going on with me? How can I deal with this? How can I help? How can I seek this? God's mercy? So it's very important to notice this emergency bell, which is the rooster's crowing, rooster's sound. So let us look at three types of negative guilt that ate me up, and I hope not, but probably eating you up too. So number one, number one type of negative guilt is there is no crowd and there is no guilt. So for these people, they have no shame. They have no conscience because it has been sealed. For example, when people, when Pilates said to the people, the crowd, when Pilates said to the crowd, I'm going to wash my hand because I don't want any guilt, I don't want any sin for killing this good man, Jesus. But what did the people reply? They said, his blood is on us and our children. These people, they had no guilt whatsoever. They didn't even hear the sound of the crowd. Let's see another example. Here in this picture, we have Adolf Eichmann. He was a very popular, very prestigious general during World War II in Nazi. Uh, you see him on the very second to the right. You see a man smiling. Uh, he was a man uh, responsible for creating the Nazi camp, for creating a concentration camp. He was responsible for killing millions of Jews and Hungarian people. And see on this picture, he's smiling. He was proud for his action. This was a concentration gas room where they killed a lot of Jews in there. And Adolf Eichmann was responsible for this action. Uh, so Adolf Eichmann, uh, this is his trial picture after the World War II was over. He fled to Argentina, but they captured him from Argentina. And they brought him to Israel for the uh, prosecution, for the trial. People all imagined him as a very cruel man, a man without a heart. But on the contrary, he was a nice man. He was a man of hard worker. You know what he defended himself? He said that, I would rather feel guilt if I didn't do my work properly. He said he did his part 
because of his responsibility. So for him and for the people who shouted for uh, Jesus Christ on the cross, they had no crow whatsoever. They didn't hear the sound. The second type of guilt, they hear the crow, they hear the sound of the crow, but they don't care about it. It's called indifference. Let's see. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of garden. And the man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. You all know the story of Adam and Eve. You see how Adam hid away from the God when he knew that he had done something wrong. What, what does he do? He doesn't deal with this guilt. Rather, he excuses himself and he blames God for putting Eve that Eve had brought apple to him. This is a perfect example of indifference. He, does, he didn't care about what the call was crying. Here, this is Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 7. On Acts chapter 2, Peter preaches, to the, preaches the gospel to the people, and the people replies by, what shall we do? I'm impressed with your speech. I'm impressed with your sermon. So what should I do, brother Peter? But on the second passage, this is a different reaction from the people. This is a prophet's defense preaching to the people. And the, see the, how people react, furious and gnashed with teeth at him. And as you see in this picture, they grabbed him. They threw away out of, outside of the city. And what did they do? They killed the prophet, Stephens, with the stone. So same message delivered, but different reaction from the people. In my opinion, the first type of people, they had good guilt, godly guilt. So when they heard the gospel, when they heard the good message, they said, what can I do to be a help? Second type of people, they were indifferent. Even though they heard the message, even though they heard the sound of prom, they said, I don't care about you. Instead, I'm going to kill you for giving me that message. Third type of guilt is rooster, rooster cross all day. So you're constantly hearing the rooster crying. And what does that do to you? It's going to make you crazy. It's going to make you choose radical choices. See what Judas had done to him. Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. Well, if Judah was like Adolf Ahimed, the man who's responsible for concentration, he would have been proud for his action. Uh, he would have uh, taken the money and be rich. But Judah, unfortunately, he had he heard the rooster crying all day, so he killed himself. Uh, this is a sailor, a uh, sailor uh, ferry. This accident happened in Korea. This accident happened in 2014 on April. Uh, among 476 passengers, 304 passengers have passed away. And the sad, very sad part is, mostly secondary school students died from this accident. And then a uh, more sad story for me was the vice principal of the school, he took his life away. He didn't die from this accident, he was at his home. He watched the news and he said, oh, those are my students. He took responsibility for himself and he killed, he committed suicide. Why did he do that? I didn't understand. This news was more shocking to me than the accident, the ferry disaster. Because this suicide could have been prevented with proper education. However, he killed himself. This is what he wrote on his last will. He said, um, I can't live this life by myself, uh, knowing that my students have died. Please, I'm going to take full responsibility. So burn my body and put away my ashes into the sea where they died, so that I can be their teacher after death. That was his last will. I admire him. I respect him for this for his mentality, for this, for taking responsibility. But it was a pitiful and sad death. Why? Because this death will not do anything. You know, this death will not make any difference to the society. He can't bear all the cross by himself. He can't bear all the burden by himself. 
he had to turn toward Jesus Christ, who does that for us, right? However, he heard the crowd crying all day. That drove him crazy. That drove him to make radical choices. So he wrote the will, and he died. This is what Ellen G. White says. Satan uses your sinful actions to make you believe that you have missed salvation. This is what Satan is good about. This is what Satan does. He makes you believe that. So now, let's look at some good examples and, and let's end our sermon. First example is from David. That David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. You know, David was a sinner. He committed a lot of crime. He killed Uri by, by, by a sword and he took away his wife to become, to make him his wife. However, as you can see on this picture, David goes through true conversion. When Nathan, when Prophet Nathan came, David heard the sound of a crawl, and that made him to believe in God again. That made him to, to have a true conversion. This is godly sorrow. This is a good example of godly sorrow. Let's look at the second example. So the second example is Jacob. So Jacob had sinned too, and because of his past action, that was threatening his family. So what does he do? Even though the angel says, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. So his past sins, so his guilt was holding up on his ankle. But Jacob, he fights with that. He holds on to the angel, he, he holds on to God tightly so that he can gain salvation. This is another good example. So while Jacob was wrestling all night, Satan saw this opportunity and he implemented bad, bad ideas. He implemented worldly sorrows unto him. Satan tried to break his trust in him by discouraging him, by, serving, by persuading him to feel guilt. However, Jacob held on to Angel firmly and asked for mercy until he was victorious. And this is a good example. And this will be the last one. So Peter, when Peter had sinned, he broke down and wept. He broke down on the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus used to pray. And this is what he says, the grass was soaked with tears of contrition. That was sincere remorse. The sorrow for detestation of sin with a true purpose of amendment. So Peter, he confessed all his sins in front of God, even though that was shameful. And then he asked, he begged for mercy like Jacob. He held on to Jesus Christ. And then, what's the result of that? He left the Garden of Gethsemane as a new man. That's what Jesus does to you. That's what Jesus does to you. So on here, uh, Micah 719, this is another good verse, it says, You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities in the depths of the sea. So when we turn to Jesus Christ, when we don't believe in ourselves, but believe in Jesus Christ, He throws all our guilt, all our worldly sorrows into the ocean. And this is what He says. He put up a sign for us. He said, no fishing. Since I've already threw all your sins away, all your guilt away, you don't have to fish for it anymore. That's going to make it worse. And Jesus has paved the road for us, a very good road, so, which leads to salvation. Uh, this is the last quote that I have to share for you. When Satan comes to you, when he approaches you by sweet talks and saying, you're not worthy, you know, you're not good. Last night, I was thinking to myself, Jay, who are you to give a sermon? You know, you're not a perfect person. I know that what you're thinking, you know, you're not a good person. Whenever Satan does that to you, please remember this. Turn your eyes upon your Savior and praise about His merit. Because Jesus Christ died for our sins and He threw away all our sins into a deep, deep water. So Satan challenged Judah. He saw an opportunity and crawled upon him. He said to Judah, Hey Judah, you cannot undo your action. 
everything you wrote down, it was in pen. How can you undo that? He said, you're a traitor. You killed the Son of God. You killed Jesus Christ, an innocent man. How can you live with that? Judah gave in to that. Judah succumbed to that. And then he took his life away. For us, we shouldn't do that. We should focus on this Bible message. It says, come to me, all who you are weary and burdened, and I will give you the rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You need to remember this picture. Jesus Christ put up this sign for us. It said, no fishing. a second chance. Thank you for showing us a mercy. Thank you for carrying the cross for us. For we have sinned, we have took away all our sins when we confess, and then you threw away all the sins into the deep sea. Thank you for taking away all our sorrows. Lastly, I want to pray for the tithe and the offering. Help us to use this money wisely so that we can use it for the church, so that we can use it for the poor people who need this money. We thank you, Lord, for all your blessings and all your mercy. Help us to have a wonderful, happy Sabbath. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.